helped build the Navigators. And when I look at Jim's life and his influence and his long, a decades long time of beholding Christ, of knowing Christ and making him known, I can't help but do the same. Here's a guy that, that followed Christ for over 70 years, almost 80 years, and at the end of his life still decided the gospel is the greatest thing I can share with somebody. An even greater way, though, to be spurred on to continue in following Christ than, than being amazed by the saints that have followed Christ for a long time is simply by beholding the greatness of Christ. Beholding the greatness of Christ and who he is encourages us, reminds us of why we should follow Christ for a lifetime. And our passage this morning leads us to do just that. Our big idea this morning is behold Jesus, the founder of our salvation. And we're going to answer two questions, or we're going to answer the question why this morning, and there's two answers to that question from this passage. Just two points for you this morning. The first is, he became lower than the angels to restore our destiny. Second, he tasted death to bring many sons to glory. So now let's just jump right in and behold Christ together as we see that Christ became lower than the angels. So as we begin this morning, we're really kind of continuing on. This is almost like a part two to last week's sermon that Pastor Andy gave. He concluded last week with a challenge to us to not drift away from Christ. And this is a concept that's going to continue throughout the book of Hebrews. There's going to be numerous resources or um, warnings, I should say, to continue following Christ. But specifically in chapters one and two, there's this comparison being laid out between Jesus and the angels. Who is greater? And as we dig into these verses, um, we will answer the question that really ultimately Jesus is indeed greater. And the answer is going to come in three parts in verses 5 through 9. The design, the problem, and the solution. So first, the design. Verses 5 through 8 say this. We're going to read kind of 8a, if you will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, you may have heard these words and think, I've heard those before. That's actually Psalm 8. The author of Hebrews is reciting Psalm 8 for us. And, and in doing so, he's reminding us that the original design for mankind um, was to have dominion over creation. That was the design that God put forth um, before sin entered the world. After all, God created man in his image. The angels were not given that, that opportunity to have dominion, nor were angels created in the image of God. Genesis, um, in the beginning of Genesis, we see a specific way this plays out. Um, Adam is naming the birds and the animals. Now, why does Adam do this? Because God didn't have the creativity to do it, but Adam did? No, because God was giving Adam dominion over creation. And David is in all of this. He's, he's, he's looking out at creation, looking at it, how majestic it is, and he says, this is a beautiful world we live in. How could God, isn't it amazing that God would give man such a specifically high place in this world. But as verse 8 continues, there's a problem. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. So the design was for mankind, and when I say man here, I'm talking men and women, mankind, human beings, to have a special place of dominion. But we're not seeing that. This isn't news to you, I'm sure of that. This world is broken. There's broken order. I think of the wildfires that raged in Maui. If we had dominion over that, we could just stop them, but we couldn't. It took firefighters weeks to stop them and gain control of them, and it left destruction in its past path. Or what about the COVID-19 pandemic? There's plenty of smart people here in the United States and around the world, but it, COVID keeps reappearing, right? We haven't just been able to stop it. Our marriages, our workplaces are not without conflict, one Bible teacher reminded me as I was reading and studying these last two weeks that outside of our world, there's, there's some even bigger problems than we see. And it's easy for us to forget that around the world, there's, there's places where there's clean water and food insecurity. If we had dominion over the world, those things wouldn't necessarily be an issue. Now, these problems have gone unsolved for quite some time, and the world is broken, but that's not the way it was supposed to be. 
But there is a solution. There is hope. Jesus. Verse 9 says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So you and I look around and we might see chaos, but we also have hope because this verse says we see Jesus. But why is Jesus our hope? Well, Jesus is our hope because he is the new and better Adam. Dr. Al Mohler is the president of Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and he writes this. He says, The first Adam plunged humanity into sin and death. The last Adam, Jesus, was plunged into death for the sake of humanity. Church, Jesus is the ideal image bearer. Adam's sin ruined the dominion that man was supposed to have over creation, but Christ is the solution to the problem. And so because of that, I want to say to you this morning, behold Jesus and his greatness. He lowered himself below the angels temporarily to restore us and break the curse that sin and death had brought upon mankind. He suffered and died to fulfill Psalm 8 and bring us back to our destiny of having dominion over creation. And as a result, he is now crowned with glory and honor and is, great, and is now greater. He's, he's greater than all things, including angels. So this morning, I want to encourage you to not lose hope and drift away as you see brokenness and chaos, not just in this world, but even in your own life. Instead, behold Jesus, the true and better Adam, who tasted death to deliver us from the disorder and sin in ourselves and in our world. Now, we need to ask ourselves, what do we do with this destiny being restored? But, but first, we also need to acknowledge that there will be a day that Christ will come back and he will usher in the new heavens and new earth. And as scripture teaches, we will rule over the new creation with him. Now, obviously, that has yet to happen. So what do we do in the already? Well, there are still implications for today. And one specific application, I think, is for us to behold Jesus and as we do, to use our authority as originally designed. So, husbands, out of an overflow of your identity in Christ, lead your families. Love and serve your wife and kids. Another implication for us is to work diligently. If you own a business or you have people that work for you, do it with integrity and diligence. And some of us should consider actually being involved in other leadership responsibilities like running for public office to bring biblical um, truths into our government. Some of us should lead the PTA or Boy Scouts or coach T-ball, all while ruling those areas with a kingdom purpose to advance the kingdom of Christ by honoring and exalting Christ in those areas. I want to give you the alternative, though, quickly. The alternative to beholding Christ is beholding yourself. When you behold yourself, conflict follows because you don't get your way. When you behold yourself, what's the point of running for office? You're not advancing an agenda that has eternal implications. You're just advancing something that's a good idea for right now. What are you fighting to accomplish? See, Christ's death has freed us from this small way of thinking and has given us this eternal um, implications a kingdom to advance. See, Adam cared first about his desires and when he did, sin entered the world. But Christ cared first about those he loved and paid our penalty so that we could now care first about lifting up his name in all areas of our lives. And that's what it means to be a Christian, is to lift up Christ in all areas of our lives. That's why it matters how you coach T-ball and how you lead the PTA and how you work in your jobs and how you interact with your wife and kids and your friends because being a Christian impacts all areas of your life. Pastor Matt Chandler says that discipleship to Jesus is the continual surrender, that means it happens over and over again, continual surrender of all of life to God's good design for identity, purpose, and belonging. So even though there's brokenness in this world and there's brokenness in your life, behold Christ and remain steadfast in him. Don't waver. Instead, surrender all of life to him. 
He has fulfilled the promise of all things being subject to him by tasting death for everyone. So let's now move to our second point this morning. And as we do, we're going to explore further Jesus tasting death. And as we do, we're going to find that we need to continue beholding Jesus, the author of our salvation, because he brings many sons to glory. In this second point, we're going to see that it is critical for us to understand that our salvation is dependent on Jesus becoming human. Michael Kruger is a scholar, and he writes, if Jesus was not really human, then he could not really represent us. And if he could not really represent us, then he could not save us. So with that in mind, let's keep reading. Verses 10 and 11 say this, For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source, That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. Did you catch the big idea language in there? Jesus is the founder of our salvation, yet he had to become a man. He had to become human to be the founder of our salvation. D.A. Carson, another biblical scholar, explains this founder idea a bit more by saying that Jesus is both a champion and a pioneer. He writes, you see, he's more than a champion who does something on our behalf. He's the pioneer who goes first, but he's more than a pioneer. He doesn't just go first. He's the champion who makes it possible for all the rest of us to go. See, in Jesus' perfect obedience to the Father's will while he lived on earth, he made it possible for us to be saved. But he also makes it possible for us to be adopted into God's family. See, we are sons of God, but we are also brothers with Christ. We think, how can this be the case? Well, this passage just told us that Jesus is the one who sanctifies and we are the ones who are being sanctified and sanctified is just a fancy way of saying becoming more like Christ, becoming holy. Because Jesus, the one who makes us holy and us who are becoming holy, have the same source, the Father, we're brothers with Christ. And plainly, this passage says he's not ashamed of that. Jesus is not ashamed that we are his brothers. So behold Christ. He's made it possible for us to be his brother. And there is nothing that you can drift to apart from Christ that's going to make you right with God. There's nothing apart from Christ that's going to bring you back into his family. Jesus had to be the pioneer and take on flesh and live the life that you and I could not live so that he could be the champion and win the way back for us. And that's done. It's it's accomplished. Jesus did it once and now we are made right before God. Let's continue though. Christ's humanity was also necessary to ensure victory over Satan. Verses 14 through 15 explain this. They say, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Did you catch that? Because Christ came to earth, took on flesh and blood, meaning he became a human, and died for the purpose of defeating the devil, that means that now the devil has no rule and reign. Now, to be clear, am I saying that that God delegated the power of death to Satan? No. God God is powerful over all things, but we can say that Satan has power over death because when he influences mankind, He influences them towards rebellion from God. And when we rebel against God, we face death. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. What is due us for our sin is death. But since Jesus in his life and resurrection has has defeated Satan, as this text tells us, we no longer need to fear death. Death is not your destiny anymore. Our future is glory with God because we are being made sons and daughters of glory. Now, I'll be honest in talking about this verse with Pastor Matt for our Manion congregation. I was struck by the rest for my soul that this verse provided. I regularly fear death. I don't know about you, but I do. For me, it's sort of trivial because one of the biggest triggers for anxiety in my life are like medical things. 
even this week, I had this, I don't know, I've had this like weird bump on my leg for like a month. And I was like, what is it? It's going to be horrible. Like, this has to be something terrible. I saw the doctor and he's like, I think you might have just gotten bit by a spider. And it's healing. But I don't need to fear death. Even in those moments, the application for my heart should be, death is not where I'm headed anymore. Even if this bump on my leg led me to die and something will eventually lead me to die, I'm, I'm going to go experience glory with God. It's okay. Now, maybe for you, fear of death comes out differently. You look at your life and you think, man, when I die, I, I just keep messing up. It's not going to end well for me. I've messed up so many times, and I've messed up in the same areas so many times. Sanctification is tough work, right? Coming face to face with your sin is tough work, but it's not meant to leave you feeling condemned. And so this, in fact, Scripture tells us that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so this verse gives us the assurance here that when you, when, you face de- when you do die, condemnation is not your future, but glory is because we've been wiped clean by the true and better Adam, Jesus. Your future hope is as a son and daughter of glory. So behold Christ. Do not drift away when you're fe- fearful over death or feeling condemned. Look, I, nothing, is, nothing you use to numb your angst and pain of fear of death is going to help you. It's all destructive and it's all inferior to the greatness of Christ. It could be drugs and alcohol or some other destructive, addictive behavior like that, but it could just simply be getting my way so that I feel comfortable. Even that isn't going to take away your fear of death. It's Christ and he's already done it. You're not in bondage to it anymore. He solved the problem. You are set free. So there's one more reason in this verse why it's super important that we not neglect the humanity of Christ. Verse 17 tells us that God is both just and the justifier. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. See, in Old Testament times, the high priest atones for the sins of the people by making a sacrifice for their sins. But as our high priest, Jesus doesn't just make a sacrifice for our sins. He is the sacrifice for our sins. And as the sacrifice for our sins on the cross, God pours out all of the wrath and anger that was due me and due you on Christ. That's really what this fancy word propitiation means in verse 17. But here's the thing. You may think that's incredibly unjust. Jesus was innocent. Why did all of the wrath and anger have to be poured out on him? Well, God is just in doing that because wrath is due sin and and our sin was placed on Christ. But the good news is, is that God is also able to forgive us and justify us because Christ lived a blameless life on our behalf. His righteousness is transferred to us. Again, you are wiped clean. God is both just in punishing sin, but he's also able to justify us. So I say again, behold Jesus, the founder of our salvation. He is bringing many sons to glory. He had to become a human so that he could be our high priest. All along the way this morning, we've looked to Christ We've seen his greatness. And the greatness of Christ in comparison to anything we could drift to is just, Christ is just simply greater. Our passage this morning, though, continues with a call um, for us to look back while we look forward as a Christian. Verse 18 says, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Church, I, I want you to really understand that this morning that you are, we are all simply mistaken when we neglect to consider the fact that Christ became a human. When Christ was on earth, he was fully God and also fully man. The Bible tells us as much that he came to earth as a baby and he probably cried just like your kids did. He made dirty diapers just like your kids do. But the scriptures also tell us he grew up into a man. 
And eventually, around the age of 30, he started his ministry. Jesus didn't just show up on earth as a 30-year-old, right? He grew into, he experienced all of life. And that means he's experienced all the temptations that you've experienced. He's experienced the hurt you felt. You may think, what I'm going through right now, Christ did not go through. That's just simply not what scripture teaches us. He's been betrayed. He's been lonely. He's been angry. He's been rejected. He was rejected by his father on the cross. And not only did he feel that pain of grief, but he also felt physical pain, right? He was beaten prior to his death. So what do we do now? As we behold Christ, what do we do now? Well, I'm going to borrow um, two applications from Dr. Al Muller's commentary on this passage. First, as we behold Christ, we should look back to what Christ has accomplished as we look forward to the hope of his second coming. And this looking back as we look forward should actually be a daily practice. Remember last week, Pastor Andy mentioned that drifting away is not an overnight change. You don't just drift away from Christ like that, right? It's a slow fade. And the antidote to drifting away and giving into temptations to build your life on something other than Christ is, is daily reflecting on the greatness of Christ. Remembering how great he is, that he disarmed death, that he absorbed God's wrath, that he removed bondage to the fear of death. See, uh, money, status, possessions, getting your way, none of that can solve the sin problem. And, and I'll be honest, that's encouraging for me because I don't know about you, but when I hang out with friends or family members that have a lot more money than me, I think that seems like it solves their problems. But even if it makes their life a little bit easier, it doesn't solve the sin problem, which is the greatest problem any of us will ever experience. Christ has solved that problem. And so when you think like that, and I just admitted that I don't do it well, when you think like that, it's easier to follow Christ for a lifetime. And I'll be honest, I'm praying this for me and for our church. We're headed towards something really significant in January, becoming accredited, becoming independent from City Light Maniunk. And as we do that over the next couple of months, I want us to behold Jesus. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this Hebrews sermon series. Because through this sermon series, we're going to daily or every Sunday see the surpassing worth of Jesus. Okay, secondly, second application for us this morning, approach Christ with confidence and faith pray. That's really what this means, pray. And as you pray, know God hears you. See, Jesus has made a way for us to approach the throne of God with grace, with confidence and faith, and that can't be taken away from us. And so I want to ask you this morning, first, are you praying confident prayers? Are you praying like you believe that God actually wants to answer your prayers? But then secondly, what are you praying for? Maybe you're praying for the salvation of a family member, a coworker, or a child. Maybe you're praying for our church as we prepare for this accreditation. Maybe you're praying that we would have numerous baptisms this fall, that people would begin coming to our church that don't know the Lord, and they would be saved. God can do that. Know that God is able. This morning, if you do not yet know Christ, I want to invite you to behold him this morning. Whatever you're beholding instead of Christ, your, your hoping is going to give you hope and assurance. I want to encourage you to lay it all down and lift up Christ. Through his life and death, he's made a way for you to be a son or daughter of glory. It's the only way that's possible. For those of you who are followers of Christ, I want you to remember what he has accomplished for us. Jesus was made lower than the angels temporarily, temporarily to bring all things back into order through his death. And by becoming a man, he brings you and I to glory. He went before us as the pioneer, and he defeated death as our champion. He became our high priest. He absorbed the wrath of God once and for all. Nothing else needs to happen. It's finished. And now I want to ask you, behold Christ. He's made you a son or daughter of glory. Let's pray. Father God, we are So thankful that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. 
Lord, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. We were running the other way. Or as one author says, we were dead at the bottom of the pool, (laughs) but you breathed life into us and made us alive to live for you now. And that's only possible because of Christ. God, I just pray that the gospel truth that you've saved us and we've done nothing to earn it would set in our hearts. That we as a church would behold Jesus. That we'd look back at the cross as we walk forward. That we wouldn't drift away and that when we're tempted to drift away by money, possession, status, whatever it might be, that we would remember that Christ is greater. The sin problem has been solved. Thank you for that, God. What wonderful hope that is for us this morning. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Now, as we close, or as we move into a time of worshiping the Lord through song, we're going to take communion before that, and Pastor Andy's going to come up in a moment, but there's a couple other ways that you can respond, and they may be on the screen, but probably not because they didn't give Timothy this slide, so, unless he manifested it or something. Um, so, uh, I want to encourage you to pray. Uh, we just said that, approach the throne of God with confidence and grace. And, and you can go p- pray with Frank and say, Frank, I'm praying for this. Would you pray for that with me? And you can pray with it together. There's power in that. Um, you can also go to, to Frank for anything else. He'd love to pray with you this morning. But as we come to take communion this morning, I want to ask you to examine your hearts. Are you beholding Jesus? Is Jesus the, the thing that your eyes are fixed on, or is it something else? And if it's something else, repent of that this morning. And if you've never beheld Christ this morning, I want to encourage you to do that as well. So take a few moments, check and evaluate your heart, and Pastor Andy will lead us through um, the Apostles' Creed and then communion together.